Facebook, YouTube, and many other forms. I bless you today for being with us. Come on, park and praise. Let them know that you are in the parking. We thank the Lord this morning for the sun shining, and we're using complaining about it. We have a 50% chance of rain at exactly 10 a.m. So we're going to worship God the best way we know how. We're going to give him honor. We're going to give him praise. We're going to give him glory. We're going to lift him on high because here in the Victorious Ministry of Victory AME, we truly believe in the church language that when praises go up, blessings come down. Is there anybody in the need of a blessing? Amen. Is there anybody happy that he just woke you up this morning and saw that you all on a brand new day that you've never seen before? Come on, let us worship God as we experience victory and join the 11th Episcopal District theme for the year. Victory starts here. Come on, let's praise God.
Come on all over the virtual platform and embark in praise. Assume your prayer positions. Let us go before the throne of grace and mercy. Gracious and wonderful God, in the blessed name of Elohim, God our Father, God the Son, and God Holy Ghost. We come this morning, God, because we are saturated this morning with your anointing. We have fresh oil, God, in the name of Jesus. And we come to praise your holy and most reverent name, reverent name, God. We came to be a blessing today, God, by blessing you and shabaking you and high-fiving you. We came to be in your presence. We want to see your glory. We want to see your Shekinah glory in the house this morning, God, which is the park in praise and the Facebook Live, the virtual platform. We came, God, so that not only might we sing a portion of Zion songs, but also that we might hear the word of God that's going to be preached by Reverend Soxon today, God. Oh, bless her, God, from the crown of her head to the very soles of her feet. Anoint her as you have already done and make preparation in her spirit, mind, heart, body, and soul to come to us and to break the bread of life this morning, God. The people of God are hungry for the preached word. We're hungry for a rhema word. We're hungry, God, because our souls need to be fed and we need to hear what thus saith the Lord. So, God, as we look to the hills from which comes our help, knowing that all our help comes from you. God, we just ask in the name of Jesus that you would also prepare us now to receive the movement of this worship experience in word, God, in song, in prayer, and in the word, word of God this morning. And in the words of the hymnologist, we just plead with you this morning that you would come, Holy Ghost, with all thy quickening power. Come, kindle a flame of sacred love in what can often be these cold hearts of ours. Holy Ghost, you are welcome in this place. God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we make these prayers and petitions before you that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. And when it's all said and done, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory, for we know that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And it is in the mag magical name and the most majestic and holy and sacred name of Jesus Christ that we pray. And the people of God said amen, 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 amen. and amen. Because of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Because of who you are. You are, I give you glory every day because of who you are, I give you praise because of who you are, because of who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you. Because of who you are, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, my provider, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Nisi, Lord, you reign in victory, Jehovah Shalom. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Nisi, 
Lord, you reign in victory. Jehovah Shalom, my Prince of Peace. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Lord, I worship you because of who Amen. Go ahead and give God some praise. How many of you know who Jehovah Rapha is? Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh. And I'm so glad that I'm here this morning because I know God is Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Amen. COVID-19 hit our household, started at the youngest and worked its way all the way up to the oldest. But all of us had very minimal symptoms. And so we are grateful to God for being Jehovah Rapha, for being our healer. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is coming from 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verses 19 through 22. And it reads as follows. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. The word of God for the people of God, let us all say, thanks be unto God. Let us now worship in song. Rock. 
he is about to leave me. Oh, 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 I know you didn't leave me out here to be lonely. When I can't see clearly, I know that you are with me so I can. I just I don't believe God brought me this far to leave me. Good God, mighty God, gracious God, holy God, righteous God. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. I thank the praise ministry for that selection. Thank Jaquan for playing. Thank you all for being here. Thank God for being God. I thank Pastor for the opportunity to stand before you this morning. I'm so grateful for the Holy Spirit being indwelling. Not just in me, but in each of us. It's the Spirit of God that keeps us from day to day. And I'm just so grateful. Let us pray. Jesus, oh Jesus, have your way. Amen. My sister in ministry, Sister Lachey, came before you early and read the scripture, which from 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, 19 through the 21st, 22nd verses. But today I want to I feel the spirit leading us to look at just verse 19. Now, before I get into this, let me tell you, if I stumble over some words, forgive me. I got up this morning at 530. I was moving and shaking and working on a lot of things. And in the midst of me moving and shaking, I left my iPad at home. So I'm using this little old cell phone screen. Thank God for Apple. 
everything syncs together. But I'm using this little screen, and if the words are too small and I can't read them, I may stumble a bit. But I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit that always make up the difference. So 1 Corinthians 9, chapter the 19th verse from the New Living Translation reads as thus. Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. In my time of study, I saw three themes in this pericope from the topic dying to live or dying to serve. Those themes are salvation via sanctification, surrender, and service. This year has been a trying one for me already. I'm a teacher by trade, specifically high school mathematics. Things aren't terrible, but they could always, they could always be better. During the first week of school, we were dealing with a lot of transition. I teach freshmen mostly, so they were all new to the school, some new to the area, others new to Florida, particularly in a pandemic climate, I was aiming to be kind to them. Helping the law students find their classes, giving out pencils and paper, greeting every child as they pass through the hallways, hoping to make each feel comfortable and welcome. So when I received the new student on the Friday of the first week of school, I turned on the charm. I was careful to greet him with a smile underneath my mask. I directed him to his seat, gave him clear directions, and assured him the pretest that I was giving him would only be used for data purposes. It would be average into his overall, it would not be average into his overall grade. So when I passed by him with his head down, I consoled him and reminded him I needed that data just to know how much background information he possessed. Even when he seemed, even when he seemed sleep for the second time, I was kind when I politely rubbed his arm and said, baby, please sit up. The other students had an extra day to work on this. You only have this day. So you have to use their time wisely just to do the best you can. I was shocked, taken back, flabbergasted, confused, and totally dumbfounded with his response. He picked his head up and yelled back, quit bleeping touching me. But God, if you know me, you know that really, really jolted me. <laughs> out of my normal self. As I tell you this story, I'm reminded of why I never wanted to teach. These children are hard-headed, I said, and so disrespectful. And I don't want to go to jail, is what I told my mom and my aunt. I am certain that I'm not the only one who once held these sentiments. Parents send sweet angels to school that sometimes tragically warp into demons during transition. Many of these sweet darlings become thugs in training, hoochie mamas, sailors, dope boys, and the like the moment they hit campus. The shift is baffling. Still, I am to teach. It's my job. Even more, it's my calling. Though I threatened to quit for years and even took a semester off, I must admit I was built for this. I've attended numerous professional developments been mentored by veteran teachers, observed others in action, and dealt with children long before it was ever my profession. Though I have birthed none, I have mothered many cousins, stepchildren, ne neighborhood children, nieces, and nephews. Truly, I was built for this. But I know I'm not alone. The first responders that rushed into the site of the Twin Towers on 9-11 had trained to respond to emergency situations. None could have foretold the devastation of that day. Still, they rushed in. Surgeons spend years learning the human anatomy, watching, practicing, honing in on their skills. Mechanics have periodic mental tune-ups. They are quizzed on the latest technology and must keep abreast on how to keep our vehicles running smoothly. Ace has to keep up with the latest technology with soundboards and amplifiers and mics and the who's it was it's and, 
And I'm sure Adrian and Jaquan rehearse constantly, not just to learn new songs, but to maintain what they already know. Individuals who deal with customers over the phone train periodically to improve efficiency and customer satisfaction. No matter the career path, there is necessary initial training and continuing education. Life is no different. In this text, Paul is speaking to us about the truths of his situation. He is an apostle. He is preaching the gospel, not out of selfish gain, but because he is compelled to do so. As an apostle, he is entitled to every provision they have to offer him. He shouldn't have to work, but he has a skill. He knows how to make and repair tents. He's a free man. He owes no man any money. He was born into a family of means. He, had, he was educated by a well-respected man, trained into an honorable position, and had every reason to take life easy. But he chose a different route. He chose to fit the description Jesus preached about on the mount in Matthew 5 to be the light of the world, a city set on a hill, the salt of the earth. If Paul embraced his pedigree and position as a Pharisee, he would create a chasm that would be nearly impossible to cross. We all need to work on finding common ground. Otherwise, we make the mistake of creating lines of demarcation, boundaries aimed at separating the us's from the them, the big eyes from the little u's. So he chose to make himself of low estate, to bring himself closer to all those blessed mentioned in Matthew 5. Paul used his trade as a tent maker to compel others to Christ. The truth is, the church is supposed to be a place of unity for the gathering of believers. We come here to be trained, edified, and encouraged, educated, and so much more. Then we are to go back out into the world and make more disciples to bring into the church, which is really a conduit for kingdom work and, and continue that cycle. Accept Christ, come in to be cleansed, compel others to come, to accept Christ and to be cleansed. It should be continuous. Paul makes it clear. We are to use our training, our trades, our life experiences to upbuild the kingdom. So I get to my first theme. We are saved and sanctified. In 19, it says, even though I am a free man with no master. To have no master means you are set free. No man is supposed to dictate to you what your everyday things are supposed to be like. As a people, we have grown accustomed to oppression. In reality, many are so familiar with oppression, systemic racism, and being disenfranchised and marginalized that it has become our normal. We've grown accustomed to living in food deserts, needing to travel miles to access food and even further to access fresh and healthy food choices. It's normal to be over-policed and under-protected. It's normal to live in dangerous neighborhoods, to live in homes and apartments that are beyond our budgets, to suffer from minimal health care coverage and poor health care. This, this may not be everyone's situation, but it is so common to so many, with most being unbothered by the situation. The Jews of the first century could relate to this being undervalued and overworked. Many things have not changed, but one thing is true. We are called to trust in Jesus. Your life is not your own. The blood still works and Jesus did not give up his blood. He endowed us with power. Get off your laurels and get busy working for justice. I am free. Oppression has no control over me. The AME church, the AME church was rooted in civil disobedience. Now we, like the Corinthian church, have grown comfortable in our false sense of spiritual superiority. Paul declares that he is free and we live in and we live the same. However, in so doing, we have to die to our way of thinking, die to our selfish mentality, die to entitlement, die to self-righteousness, die to tradition, die to cultural superiority, die to every sin and the weight that does so easily slow us down and uh, and cause us to stumble. We have to die. Paul claimed, I don't have to do this, but I'm compelled to do it. We are saved to call others to salvation. Ministry does not happen at church. It happens when we leave. In this context, many have actually, many were actually slaves. There was no real middle class in ancient Rome. Either you were wealthy, really wealthy, typically, or you were dirt poor. Honestly, most were poor and the wealthy had some uh, and the wealthy had some kind of allegiance and relation to the Roman government. 
which was the source of their oppression and lack. This is not hypothetical. We're not talking about figurative slavery. They were really slaves. Literal meaning. And in the midst of this truth, Paul declares, I choose to die to my rights. I choose to give up my special treatment just so I can be of service to others. I am dying to serve. The next point submitted. I have become a slave to all people. I've become a slave to all people. I want to remember when I was a little girl, I would hear the old folks say, I want to be just like him. I want to be just like him. But do you? Jesus did a lot of things that violated Jewish custom. He hung out with unsavory people. He put himself in danger, causing riots in Rome. You cause a riot in Rome, you demand immediate action, death. They demanded order. They demanded control. But when you hear about this savior who's coming around healing people, of course you're going to bombard him. You're going to create a ruckus. And he did it anyway for the people. Why? To become all things to all people. My life is not my own. To you, I belong. I give myself away. Jesus said, I came to do the will of my father. We should be here to do the will of our father. We are multiply. We should be multiplying the, 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 the expansion, the, the reach of Jesus by our lives. Too often, the only thing we give away is a piece of our minds. We give away opportunities for growth. We give away opportunities to instill hope in others. We give away opportunities for others to draw closer to God. We just give it away. Our life experiences are no accident. Divorcees work with you. Victims of sexual assault and abuse work with you. Homeless people work with you or encounter you every day. People who feel neglected are on your job. Grieving people need comfort. Broken people need healing. Angry people need compassion. Sad people need encouragement. God wants to use us as witnesses to others. Amos 3 and 3 says, can two walk together unless they agree? More often than not, we're walking alone because we don't agree with anybody. We're not looking to find common ground. We're not looking to help anybody. We're not looking to be a word of encouragement for anyone. If it doesn't benefit me, mine, and I, I don't want to do it. How can you lead others to Christ if you don't, if you won't try to find common ground? Part of the miracle in being a Christian is that nothing is wasted. All of us have a former self. Unsavory, unpleasant, embarrassing, sinful, deserving of death and eternal damnation. But we serve a gracious God who gives us a clean slate when we turn from our wicked ways and embrace a new life in him. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for salvation. Thank you, God, for saving me. Take your story, your career, your setbacks, your mistakes, and use them. Use it all to compel others to Christ. If I had never been sexually assaulted, I couldn't share with you the power of Christ to keep your mind. If I had never been broke, I, can't, I couldn't share with you the power of Christ to provide. Just like God told Moses to strike the rock in the wilderness and water gushed forth to quench, to quench the thirst of the children of Israel in the wilderness, he spoke to strange people in strange situations to pour into my broken, pitiful situation and help me when I could not find help. Hmm. If I had not lost a loved one, I could not testify to the comforting power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Use it. If I had not been self-righteous, I could not testify to the grace of God in keeping me from self-harm. Use it. If I had never been in danger, I could not testify to the power of God to protect. If I had never been sick, I could not testify to the power of God to heal. Use it. Submission is an unconditional surrender. Being a slave does not make you a doormat. It makes you a doorway. We sit on our struggles, fearful we will be pitied or even worse, rejected. Our testimonies are powerful. When others reject our testimony, they shut the door on an opportunity to know God in a deeper way. Surrender. 
Many are waiting at your job, in the grocery store, at the nail salon, on the next customer call, in their student desk, at the next pickup game, at the basketball, at the high school football game, at the traffic light, in the basketball stands, at the next choir rehearsal, WMS meeting, to witness the power of Jesus living in you. We are tried daily. Daily we are tried, but we must surrender. Let the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each of us. As a tent maker, Paul encountered and influenced Aquila and Priscilla, who later influenced, who later influenced Apollos. Your influence is great in this generation and the generations to come. But we must first, we first have to surrender. Now, we've talked about being saved and we've talked about surrendering our way and surrendering our way of thinking so that we can be all things to all people. But why are we doing this? It's easy to be a servant. The text says to bring many to Christ. Christ to bring many to Christ. Christ will not be back until he is ready to receive his bride, the church. We are the church. Luke 6 and 31 says, treat people like you want to be treated. How do you bring people to Christ? You love them. You love them. And love is not just an emotion. It's an action word. I began by telling you that the first week of school on this baby's first day in my class, during the first period of the day, I got cussed clean out. And I'll be honest, my normal reaction would be to give back what I got. But I thank God for the Holy Spirit, for the covering of the blood of Jesus. Because I spent that whole week before praying, God, God, did, no idea, no thought, just praying. And the truth of it is, prayer still works. When you pray and ask God to come into your heart and to lead and to guide you in your every interaction, God will do just that. And you'll receive a supernatural power you never knew you had to do things you didn't know you could do. Like allow somebody to curse you out and still love on them. Does it mean that I've gained that child? No, but it means I didn't lose the rest of my class. They saw me behave in a way that was becoming. There's somebody who's only seen their parent cuss somebody out in return for cussing them out. There's a child who's never seen love in action. On your job, you are the only Bible some of your coworkers are ever going to read. In the streets, you are the only Bible. Some people, when they honk their horn at you and give you a nice little middle finger, you have to learn how to smile and love them anyway. Not in sarcasm, not to honk the horn back, not to return the gesture, but to love them anyway. Prayer covers a multitude of sins, even when you are being wronged. How do we draw others to Christ? We do it in love. Again, it doesn't make you a doormat. It makes you a doorway. Many people don't know the way. They don't understand how to get there. They don't understand what being a Christian looks like until they see it demonstrated. People online, it's important for you to know that God is looking for you to demonstrate his love. People out there parked in the parking lot, it's important for you to know that God is looking for you to demonstrate his love. He, you are the hands and feet. We are the hands and feet of God. None comes to God unless they are compelled. None are compelled unless we draw them lovingly. How do you draw them with love and kindness? It is important that we not just think that it's somebody else's responsibility to do it. We are all preachers. We are all members of the gospel. And if we fail to do our job, we fail to grow the kingdom of God. We get mad because God didn't come. God was coming through you. And you failed God. God was coming through me. And I failed God, but I'm so thankful that God gives us grace and mercy. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. The verse says, I 
have become a slave to all to bring many to Christ. But in verse 22, it says, I've become all things to all people that I might save some. What does that mean? That means that even when I've come to Christ and I've died to my old self, even when I've surrendered to the will of the people and allowed them to see the good in me, even when I'm serving them lovingly, there are still some who won't come. But do it anyway. We have a loving Savior, a darling creator, who long before we were ever, ever created, had us on his mind and in his heart. And he knew that sin would come into the world. And so he asked, who will go for them? And Jesus raised his hand and said, I will. I will go. Knowing that he'd be crucified on a cross, knowing that he'd be spit upon and talked about, the same people he had healed and saved and, and interceded on their behalf, they crucified him. And he knew it and he said, send me, Father, I will go. Because we serve a Savior who knew our evil intentions, who knew our brokenness, who knew that we weren't worthy and came anyway, he compels us to do the same. Because when you are willing to die, when you are willing to give up your way for God's way, when you are willing to say, Lord, for you, I will do it. Lord, if I'm all alone, I will go. Lord, if they reject me, I will go. When I'm persecuted, I will go. When I'm talked about, I will go. When I'm mistreated, I will go. When they don't love me, I will go. When I'm neglected, I will go. When I'm abandoned, I will go. Then you live out the great calling that we've been called into. We truly can be Christians, Christ-like, walking in the way, edifying one another and drawing others to live this great life that we've been called into. Jesus didn't die alone. He didn't die so he could do it alone. He died as an example. We must understand that we too have to carry a cross. And in order to serve, we've got to die. So I encourage you, as I encourage myself, pick up your cross. Because when you die on this side, just as we serve a mighty God who raised Jesus after three days in the grave, he's going to raise us up to life eternal and we'll be able to shout with the, with the cry triumphant that yes, God, I made it over. I made it over. Thank God Almighty, I made it over. So I encourage you as I encourage myself. Be encouraged. Die to serve. Listen. What a word, what a word, what a word, what a word. Come on, you can do better than that. Let's give the woman of God a hand. What a word, what a word, what a word. If you were not able to take any form of self-evaluation during that word of God. You need to bow down right now, humble as you know how, and ask God to help you. Because that word was a word that will encourage you. It was a word that challenged us. And it was a word that caused us to take an evaluation, a self-evaluation of who we are in Christ, where we are in Christ, and how much we are willing to obediently obey the call of God because obedience is better than sacrifice. But the preacher said in so many words that we've chosen sacrifice over obedience. When she says dying to serve, that means that the call of God upon my life for the advancement of the kingdom of God is greater than my will to physically exist on earth because I realize to die in Christ is to live. Paul wound up in prison, didn't stop his ministry. He was still writing letters, epistles we call them, out to the local churches encouraging them. And then when he came to the end of his journey, he encouraged his spiritual son, Timothy, and he let him know for the time of my departure is at hand. But brother, I want you to know, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith and I have finished my course. 
maybe there's someone there today out there in virtual space or park and praise. You haven't even truly begun this course. You've never admitted that you're a sinner who needs to be saved by grace, which simply means you are not in relationship with Jesus Christ. You have not come to know him as the son of God who died for your sins and shed his blood that you may have the gift of eternal life. And right now, you're not dying to serve. You're just dying to die and to spend an eternity in the midst of chaos of hell. I want to offer life to you. I want to offer eternal life to you so that you can die to the world and live for Christ and live eternally with God when God establishes kingdom after the second advent, the rapture we call it. But then there's so much work to do before we get there. I want to invite you to a life of activity. I want to invite you to a life of deliverance and healing. I want to invite you to a life that is liberating as you fight for liberation. I want to invite you to a life of salvation and liberation. I want to invite you to a life where you fight for against injustice and fight that justice might stand. I want to invite you to a life where culture doesn't change you, but you change the culture. I want to invite you to a life where you understand that it may look like I'm dying in the world but dying in Christ is dying to live will you come will you send us a message on Facebook will you write on your tithe and offering envelope today I want to know Jesus and finally if you've already accepted Christ as your savior but you found yourself in a place where you are estranged from God not that God is estranged from you, but you're estranged from God because you walked away from the obedience and the commandments and the things that God is asking you to do, calling to you to do, really told you to do. And today you want to reconnect and you want to reconnect with victory. You want to come back and do kingdom work. We welcome you to the victorious family where we are a victorious intercessor in Christ Center, thankful, obedient, reconciling, and yielding ministry. And I want you to know your victory can start right here. Come on, hit us up right there on Facebook Live. Write it down on your tithing envelope and bless the Lord with the presence of you for kingdom ministry. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Come on, give God a horn praise. Come on, right there where you are. Come on, get up off, get from off of that recliner, get up off of that sofa, get from behind that desk that you pulled up to. Throw your hands up into air and give God a praise, give God a glory. Come on, high five God wherever you are. I'm dying to serve because serving Christ is the most important thing in my life. Come on, give him praise, give him honor, and give him glory. To God be the glory. Great things he have done. That woman of God has shaken my spirit. Amen. We're talking about fresh oil. We got some fresh oil in this house today. Come on, we're going to bless the Lord as we move right now into our tithe and our offering. For those of you who are not giving electronically, those of you in park and praise, the ushers will come to you now. Those of you who are on our virtual platform, if you will look and you will see that we have Givelify, we have Cash App, and if you will go to our website, victoryamtampa.org, you will see the various platforms that you can give electronically through your check-in account or by your debit card. I really don't encourage people to pay tithes and offering on credit cards because to me that makes no financial sense whatsoever to give God an offering that you ain't got to pay interest on. You ought to give God an offering that God's going to give you some interest on. He's going to get you a good night's sleep. He's going to give you peace in the midst of all hell and confusion. When you bless the Lord, not only with your time and your talent, but your treasure and your testimony, God's going to bless you. He's going to heal your body. God's going to bless you because you've been a blessing to the kingdom of God. I don't know how much you have to give, but I want you to just give your very best offering that you have to give to the Lord. Because our primary ministry here at the Victorious Church is to let people know who are dying in the world of sin that God is able and God will save you. God will protect you. God will deliver you, heal you, set you free. And those who are free in Christ Jesus are free in me. Come on, give on, give the fight. I don't know what the offering is, but I just want somebody to give. I feel like we're going to get a blessing today. We we need a blessing for the kingdom of God. We need a blessing for the house we call victory. We need a blessing 
financially. We need a blessing for somebody to open up the window that God has poured out for them. Now to let the mantle flow and your cup run over. Let your cup run over into the victorious house of victory today. And God has already blessed you, but he's going to bless you some more. Come on, Lord God, enlarge our territory. We pray the prayer of Javaz. We need our territory enlarged. We know that we were born sometimes with a name that wasn't a name that sounded good, but God, you changed our name. God, you've given us new platforms. God, you've given us new ways to serve you. You're sending us new resources. You're blessing us beyond our wildest thoughts or anything that we could imagine. Come on, help me praise the Lord and bless the Lord one more time on your horn. Bless the Lord where you are. Oh, come on, magnify the Lord with me. Let us worship his name together. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be on my lips, in my mouth, saturated in my heart. Come on, when you praise God, stuff starts to happen. When you praise God, your crooked marriage gets straight. When you praise God, your hellacious house turns into a haven. When you praise God, sin begins to roll away. When you praise God, he opens a window and pause you out that blessing you have room enough not to receive when you praise God your bed of discomfort becomes a bed of comfort when you praise God the hellhounds that are tracking you will turn around and kill and sit down at the commandment of your voice oh come on give him praise and give him glory let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for what's being given to your ministry right now. We thank you, God, in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, with the power and presence of Holy Spirit, that every need in this ministry has been met, and that you will meet the needs of every person who souls into this ministry, who will give because you asked them to give. For we believe the word of God when the psalmist said, King David, I've been old and now I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread. We believe the word when the word says all things work together for the good of them who love Christ Jesus and are called according to his purpose. We believe the word, O oh God, that if we seek ye first the kingdom of God, all those things shall be added unto us. And we seal it today with our faith. We seal it today by walking by faith and not by sight. In the strong and mighty name of Jesus the Christ we pray. And the people of God said amen, amen, and amen. If the preacher will come back up and help the preacher with the um, pastor with the announcements, I want to announce again that on Wednesday afternoon at 6 p.m., we need you in the space and in the place. Uh, we're having a meeting. We've sent it out on email Thursday and Friday. It will be back on email Tuesday with the um, location. Do you have the location, Reverend? Yeah. We will send the location if she can't pull it up right quick. It's on your email. We need to meet about the redistricting that's going across the state of Florida, but in particular here in Hillsborough County. We want to make sure that district number three of the Board of County Commissioners stays a seat where we can put a person of African descent in place. We will meet at All People's Life Center. That's 6105 East Sly Avenue in Tampa, Florida on this Wednesday, three days from now on the 22nd at 6 p.m. Please be on time. You know what five o'clock traffic looks like in Hillsborough County. We need to make sure we are in the place. Amen. And your conference is right around the corner on the 21st and the 22nd. Of course, we will be in Bible study and praying and teaching on Tuesday um, night. And look on your email on Tuesday. I'm going to give Reverend Soxon, our preacher, a night for us to have um, a church conference for um, appointing of stewards and all boards, components, ministries. You need to go ahead and hold your election now because that's going to take place after the, the Tuesday, after the second Sunday in um, October next month. Go ahead and put that down, Reverend Soxon, that Tuesday instead of Bible study. We will have a Zoom church conference so we can organize our ministry for the next conference year. Amen. Did I miss any other important announcements? Any lay activity on the district that I'm not aware of? But I, I'm asking you to be where you need to be and not only be there, but be engaged and be active because there is much work to do. I want to announce that on Tuesday morning at 9.30 a.m., Hillsboro Organization for Progress and Equality would join um, the Board of County Commissioners and Hillsborough County's um, 
Housing Department. We will um, have the grand opening of the second apartment complex for um, low income housing. I think it's 60 or 65 units, a three, three and a half million dollar project. Come on, give God some praise and some glory. And that particular um, junction in our county government is named Hope because of the work of Hillsborough Organization for Progress and Quality, which your pastor now is the co-president of, really right now the only president, because my co-president got moved to Celebration, Florida. And we still have work to do. Our convention is coming up. We've held our listening process. We need you to be ready right after the annual conference to go right into the Hope Convention, where we take a vote on the issues that we are going to tackle in the upcoming calendar year of 2022. God bless you. God keep you. Heaven forever smile upon you. We're going to get out of here because rain is supposed to come at 10 a.m. And we need to break things down. But Reverend Sox are looking at the sun shining and she's saying that brother man was wrong. Thank God for the weather's man report being inaccurate. Amen. We will now have our benediction and our preacher will lead us in our benediction. Praise God. From, from whom all blessings flow. There is also cabbage. So that the church is over, come get some produce if you desire. Now, who is able to keep you from falling, keep each of us from falling, to him be glory, majesty, and honor, both now and evermore. Let all the people say,